Hello and welcome to Your Path to Success with Ruth Kearns Volman, a podcast created to inspire, encourage, and equip you on your leadership journey. My guest today is a passionate, successful, mission driven founder and entrepreneur who is an amazing example of someone who has brought together their talents, skills, experience, and passions to make a difference in the world. Not only that, but she's done it while creating a way of working that fits with her desired lifestyle needs and personality. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Jenny Rushmore, founder and creative director of Kashmirette. Enjoy the podcast. So today I'm with Jenny Rushmore, who's the founder and creative director of Kashmirette, which is an organization dedicated to empowering curvy sewists to create a dream wardrobe that actually fits. Hello, Jenny. Hi, Ruth. It's just so wonderful to be with you today and to be able to chat after not seeing each other for nearly 20 years, I think. How am I old enough, Ruth? Tell me that. <laughs> how, uh, how is that possible? I'm, I I'm, a young, I'm a young sprightly thing, I promise. <laughs> As are we all. Yeah, we both met at P&G where we were working together on the wonderful world of hair products, I think, at the time. So that's where I guess you probably started your career, but now you work in a very different world. That's right. Yes. When I was in university, I, you know, would think about what I wanted to do and I had so many interests. It was kind of hard for me to decide. And in the long term, I, I always thought, wanted to do something like mission driven. So I thought I would work for a nonprofit or I would run my own business and my parents ran their own business. So I kind of grew up with that as a thing. Mm -hmm. And very randomly, I was hanging out with a friend and they were filling out a application form for P&G for the summer. And it turned out way back in, I think, 1998, that they paid a lot of money for 19 year olds to go and work for a summer. So I decided to do it. And then almost through inertia, to be perfectly honest, they offered me a job and I thought, why not? And then they said I could move to Switzerland and I'd always wanted to move abroad. And so basically that's how my career started. Yeah. You know, as you're in a very different world now, what did you learn from working in a big multinational that has served you well in what you do now? So, I mean, I learned a lot. I think the sort of slight insight that I actually successfully had when I was 18 or however old I was, was that I could learn a lot in kind of famously well-run business that I would then be able to take into, you know, running my own company or working on a nonprofit or something like that. And when I first moved to Geneva, I was quite excited actually at the idea like, oh, I could go and work at the UN or something like that. That was in my, in my mind. Yeah. And I think there were kind of two areas that I learned a lot, huge amount at, about at P&G. The first one was really about branding and marketing. So I worked in brand management on a variety of brands and it has served me very, very well for setting up my own business. PNG famously has a lot of like kind of structures, things like who, what, how structure or like, you know, adver ways you, adver you evaluate advertising and they really are, you know, very, very useful. But I think fundamentally the idea of consumer as boss, which is how I worked with you, Ruth. And the idea of just, if you deeply understand what people need and you find the barriers to what's happening right now, like why are they not getting it? And you solve those things, then you will have a successful product. And that is quite literally how I ended up setting up my own business, like using that kind of structure and that way of thinking. The second area, and it's a funny one because I see the difference between myself and other friends I know who run businesses. P&G is extremely process oriented, which in many ways is like, you know, seems like very boring, right? Like, wow, great. You've got a lot of procedures. You're very bureaucratic. But I learned how to do that, you know, very well over 11 years at P&G and realized actually the power of that and how you can get a lot done if you have good procedures. You can be very consistent, very efficient. You can get things out to market. And so even when it was just me before I had employees, I really brought this a lot. And I actually think compared to many other people I know who do the same thing as me, I have a very small team, but we achieve a huge amount. And I would actually credit P&G with that because I think if I didn't have this like procedural process driven approach, mm -hmm. you know, we simply wouldn't be able to do it. So while there are many things that are different today than you know, when I was at P&G and at TripAdvisor, those two things I think have been core to the success of my business. Yeah. So understanding marketing 
understanding how to understand and meet people's needs and overcome their barriers. And then, you know, being able to structure things and get things done. I find it funny you say that because, you know, when I was at PNG, I used to think I wasn't very structured compared to everyone else. But since I've left, I've discovered how mm-hmm. structured I am and how yes. I am compared to the average person because it's kind of drilled into you, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. On both those fronts, to be honest, like even when I was working at TripAdvisor, they have a very, very different approach to marketing. And I would talk about things like consumer insight work and they'd be like, what are you talking about? And I would explain, you know, basic P&G things and they would be like, oh, that's that's very different. And I think when you're at a company like P&G where almost everyone joined at the age of 18, right? Like that's the most, or 20 or whatever, it's the most common thing to do. You know, the proverbial frog in the pot where you have no idea that this isn't every single company. Like you just kind of think this is what it's like. And I didn't appreciate it until I left that the like attention to training and the attention to like your career path and where you're going and making sure you're being like developed in the way that you need it's it's not unique, but it is definitely not universal across companies. So yeah, I, even though I was there for a long time and I ended up doing something very different, like I, I certainly don't regret it. Also, I got to live in Switzerland and I got to live in Greece and then America. So, you know, I have to thank them for that too. <laughs> yeah. I'm mean, just wondering because it is so different and it is the water you swim in when you're in a company like that. Is there anything you had to unlearn or came as a shock when you left? Yeah. I mean, so I, I left P&G and I went to TripAdvisor for three years. And even that was actually more of a shock than you would think. Because for instance, they didn't have many processes and things went so much faster. I just couldn't believe it. Like P&G is slow. It just is. You know, it's like, I've got this idea. I need to have a meeting with this person. Then in two months time, there's the regional meeting. And then two months after that, there's the global meeting. You know, there's there's a lot of layers. And it was actually very freeing in many ways to, I would be like, oh, do I need to run this past legal? And they'd be like, why would you have to run your marketing copy past legal? And it was like, oh, wow, we can actually go really fast and be really nimble. And I found that actually very liberating because like I am a person who, you know, thinks of things fast and likes to just get on and do things. And probably that was also part of the reason that I did end up uh, setting up my own business. Yeah. So here you are now. You're running your own business. It's a mission-driven business. It's all about sewing. So let's just leap to how did you get into sewing? So I've always been artistic. It was definitely something earlier in life, like, do I go down an artistic route or a business route? And I decided, you know, I'd do art on the side. And I had a list of hobbies that I, a literal list, like a written down list of things I'd like to try, like ceramics, photography, that kind of stuff. And sewing was on the list, but I hadn't really thought about it much. And I didn't really know anyone who sewed. And funnily enough, it was at PNG when I moved to America and I was working for Gillette that PNG had bought that I bumped into my friend Karen Kirby at the time. And she was wearing this unbelievable pencil skirt that was striped. It was like bright stripes. And I was like, that's really cool. Where did you buy it? And she said, Ikea. And I was like, what do you mean? Does Ikea do skirts? And she's like, no, no, no. I bought the fabric at Ikea and I made the skirt. And I had honestly literally never heard of anyone making their own clothes before. Like my mother doesn't. I didn't have any friends who did. And I was like, wow, that's that's really interesting. I maybe I should try doing that. So I did a sewing class and it was immediately like just transfixed by this. The sewing class itself was actually very poor, but it was like the clouds parted. Right. And it was like, (laughs) Oh, this is, this is really cool. And the reason that I particularly thought it was cool at the beginning is that I'd always struggled to find clothes. And there were two reasons I'd always struggled to find clothes. The first one, which kind of leads to the second one is that I've always been on the bigger side, like, you know, UK 18 and I have big boobs. And what that meant was, especially in 2010, it's a bit better now, but there were very, very few stores that carried my size. I mean, when I lived in Geneva, I think there was one or two shops in the entire city that I could buy the clothes in, which is ridiculous because I am actually like a very averagely sized woman, but plus size. So I couldn't fit in anything. And so immediately I was like, huh. I wonder if this means that I could actually make clothes that fit me because I was really used to wearing things that were like baggy or they were too tight or like if they fit in one place, they didn't fit in another. And then the second thing is 
even if I could find some clothes that fit me, they weren't what I wanted to wear. Like I'm a kind of big personality. Like I like bright colors. I like bold prints. You know, I had all these ideas of how I'd like to present myself and I didn't, I couldn't because I simply didn't fit in those stores. So the idea of like trying on different looks was like kind of impossible. Like I I would stick to the few online places that I had. And so when I started to sew, I was like, hold on a second. This means that I could make clothes that actually fit me, that express my personality. Now, the funny thing is, is that I immediately, it's not really funny. I immediately came into the same issue as I did with ready to wear clothes, which is that many of the sewing patterns weren't made for me either. So Mm. many sewing patterns were maxing out at an 18 and they were made for a B cup and I'm an H cup. So even if they had an 18, it wouldn't fit me. So I learned how to alter sewing patterns, which is an annoying thing to have to do as a beginner because it's like a advanced skill, but I learned how to do it. And that was really the life-changing moment for me Mm -hmm. because it's very hard to feel good about yourself and your body if you don't fit in clothes and stores. It's like this constant judgment of you. Like, well, you're not normal, are you? Because if you can't fit in clothes in 90% of the stores in your city, you know, something's wrong with you. And so I was always dieting. I felt very bad about myself. And suddenly I had this realization that I could change my clothes to fit my body and not change my body to fit clothes. And it was truly profound. And I started blogging and I started sharing what I was making and slowly but surely, like my, my self-confidence really started improving. I started feeling much better about myself when I was wearing clothes that actually fit me well and express my personality because I could finally wear whatever I wanted to and any fabric I wanted to. So it was actually, you know, an obsession from the minute that I learned to sew and learned to fit, it just became something that I felt very passionate about. So you discovered this hobby, you loved the process and you loved what it gave to you. It was very liberating. And it sounds like it had also a a profound effect on your mental health. And Mm -hmm. what what happened when you started to blog and you started to have reactions from other people? Yeah. So the blog is what directly led to me setting my business up. So I started blogging. And at the time, the sewing blogosphere was like huge. Like it was very, very popular. It was the place to be. These days it's Instagram, but it was blogs. And there weren't many plus size women blogging because I think traditionally it's like, you know, hide yourself and like people don't feel very confident about their looks. And I got a really, really positive reaction. Until the point I reached where I had literally like over a hundred thousand readers. So like a huge, huge readership. And I literally remember the point when I decided to set up my business, like the, the very evening I decided to set it up. So I'd always had this idea that I wanted to run my own business, but I knew that I wanted it to be something I cared about. My parents had a business but they didn't kind of care about the subject that much. And I think sometimes it's quite, can be quite hard when you're going to do tough things in the business, but you don't care particularly about the subject of it. And I was like, I don't want to do that. If I'm going to do it, I want something I really care about. And I was thinking, and I was brushing my teeth and I was thinking, you know, someone needs to come out with plus size sewing pants. Like I can't believe it doesn't exist. And they need cup size ones because the average woman's a D and they're being made for a B and I'm an H. Like there need to be that. And I'm brushing my teeth and I'm like, someone needs to do that. I mean, it can't be me because I don't know how to draft patterns. And then I stopped and I thought, do you know what? I know someone who drafts patterns. And then I thought, you know, if you run a restaurant, you don't have to be the chef, do you? Like you need to have the idea, but maybe I could do this. And I got into bed and I messaged her on, I think Facebook on my phone and said, Hey, Alison, if I was interested in setting up a sewing pattern company just for plus sizes and with bigger cup sizes, is that something you could help me with? And she's like, yep. And we had a meeting the next day. And that was literally the beginning of Cashmere. I knew the majority of women are plus size. So like about 70% of women are plus size. The mm-hmm. average bra size is a double D. And so the funny thing is people would say, oh, you're getting into this great niche. It's like, it's not a niche. When 70% of the population is in a size range, that's not a niche. That's the majority of the market. Mm. So I started off in that size range. Now I actually have in American sizes, zero to 32. That's UK four to 36. So now I have a very, very broad range, Mm -hmm. but I started in that plus range. And 
I launched my first product in October 2015, which is the Appleton Wrap Dress, which is still a top seller of ours. And it was immediately successful. And I think it's sort of funny because I think now if people want to start a business from scratch, they're often told like work on content marketing and establishing yourself as an expert in the field. And you want like deep SEO. But I had done that organically because I'd been blogging for six years already. People already knew who I was. I already had a following. And so I was able to turn around and be like, hey, everyone who follows me, I now have something. Are you willing to pay me $14 for it? And it turned out they were. And that now was eight years ago. Yeah. Wow. It's it's an incredible journey, isn't it? And I think it's many people have the dream of making their hobby their job very few people actually succeed, I would say, out of the people who try. You obviously had a moment of revelation, not just that you could change your own life, but you could change other people's lives and that this was really possible. But obviously, there's a lot more that goes into a decision to quit your job and everything that's working in your life and start your own business. How did you go about that process? So I think in many ways, it was probably an easier decision for me than it would be for the average person for a couple of reasons. The first one is I grew up with parents who ran a small business and they started it from scratch. They had much less work experience actually than I had when they decided to do it. And it went very well. And, you know, my father, the one thing he said (laughs) a long time ago was like, try and work for yourself as soon as you can. Like, don't be beholden to like a management structure and things like that. So I had that in my mind. So I always was thinking about it pretty much like, you know, since I started working. The other thing is that I realized that in the position I was in, which was, you know, I'd saved money over the years. And at the time, it was just like single, didn't have a kid, just responsible for myself that there was all this upside and actually very little downside. I had enough money to like keep me through a few years of not earning so much. That was fine. That didn't really bother me. And then when I really thought about it, and it was again, discussion a bit with my family, it was like, okay, I'm going to give this two years. That was my thing. I'm going to give it two years. If at the end of two years, it isn't the right thing, I'll go back and get a corporate job. And I think especially in the US, there's actually kind of almost a valorization of entrepreneurs. So it's like, good for you, you know, like you tried. And I thought if in two years time, I try and get a job, I can explain, you know, I set up a brand from scratch. I had to work on supply chain. I had to work on e-commerce. I'll be able to talk about all these skills I learned. And I never went to business school. It's a little bit like going to business school, except, you know, instead of paying 150 grand, maybe you make 150 grand, kind of a better ROI. And so when I thought about it, I was like, you know, there's all this upside and there's actually very little downside. So I'm just going to give it a go. I appreciate that people can be in very different positions. You know, like if I had a big mortgage or as like a primary breadwinner for the family, probably wouldn't be such an easy decision. But for me, with what I wanted to do, yeah, it actually, it actually wasn't that hard a decision to come to. And I have not regretted it for like even a nanosecond since the day I quit my corporate job. Yeah. So for you, it wasn't so much a challenge from a risk point of view. You were able to weigh up the risks and benefits of of giving it a go, at least for two years. You gave yourself a time frame. When did you know this is it? This is the lifestyle I want? Well, I'd say there were two steps. This is the lifestyle I want. I mean, like, you know, the first day. I mean, it just suits me so much more. I actually found out fairly recently that I have ADHD and it explains quite a lot of things about me. And, you know, ADHD, I think people are beginning to understand more, shows up very differently in women and like women who've had kids. Like it's it's not, you know, as I say, karate chopping and chemistry class, right? Like eight-year-old boy, it's a bit different. But one of the things is I find it very, very hard to be bored or to be forced to do something I don't want to do, right? Those are two things that in particular. And corporately, that was difficult for me because it was like, even if you finished your work, you still have to stay till 5.30. Even if you don't feel in the mood to do a spreadsheet, you have to do a spreadsheet today. And within, you know, minutes of me not having that job, I was able to like relax into like going with my energy and it was profound. Now, even before I knew I had ADHD, I knew that that was a big thing. So my work is incredibly varied. Like, so literally I could be sewing, although I don't actually sew very much or designing and looking for inspiration. I could be doing bookkeeping. I could be working on strategy. I could be doing graphic design. I could be writing a blog post. I could be doing photography. And I found it so exciting that like I'd had this variation of things that I could work on and I could choose. I just wake up and be like, 
Sometimes I'm in the mood to do spreadsheets. Sometimes I'm not. It was amazing. I was like, this is what I want. Like if it's a sunny day, I don't work, you know, I'll go and do something else. Now, the bigger question though was, sure, everyone would like to do that, right? But there's a reason not everyone does it because you need to make enough money to be able to do it. You know, like working a 30 hour week is great, but like you need to sustain yourself. So on that front, it was only two years ago that it became clear. So until two years ago, and Cashmere has been going for about eight years now, I was like, I love this. This is amazing, but it can't go on forever because I'm not making enough money to like justify it. Like I was making quite a lot less than I learned in corporate. Two years ago, my business had a massive acceleration through the launch of our membership program. And it just like transformed the financial side of the business. And that was when at the end of the year, I did the books and I went, I am never having a corporate job again. Never. It will never happen because now I earn much more than I could in a corporate role. And I love my work. I'm also a single mom by choice. So I have my daughter with a donor. It's just me. She doesn't have a, a, another parent. And it's so conducive to that. You know, like I run my own business. I have my employees who work for me. If she's homesick, I just go, I just bring her home. You know, like I, I have so much flexibility in my life, which frankly, if I had still been working at PNG, that would actually been very difficult. Like I'm actually not entirely sure how I would have had a happy life as a single mom. But as it is, you know, it works so well. So yeah, I, I think that two years ago, that's when it was like, okay, this isn't changing. This is for the long haul. I will keep on doing this. Mm. So we've talked about the business and after eight years, you're making more than you did in corporate, which is amazing. And congratulations. And you've got the lifestyle you want. Tell me more now about what it means to you to have created a purpose-driven business where you're serving a whole bunch of women who didn't have something there for them. Yeah. So that is by far my favorite thing about the business. So I think whatever you can work, wherever you work on, you can always find some angle on it, right? So like, you know, I worked on like feminine hygiene products. I'm like, you can find an angle to feel good about that. But with what I do in terms of like empowering women to feel good about their appearance and about enabling them to like express themselves how they wanted to, it is such a profound part of people's lives. And I think, and sometimes people think, oh, you know, fashion is a little bit, shallow. But the reality is like how you appear has a huge impact on how people respond to you. And especially women in bigger bodies for a long time have been very, very restricted in how they can present themselves to the world. And just like me feel very like judged. Like we live in an incredibly fat phobic society. Like it might be improving, but it's still very, very harsh. And so as a result, you know, my customers and I have them all around the world it's this very, very life-changing thing for many of them. We get feedback a lot from our sewing patterns, from our online workshops, from the two books that I have now written, where people are saying, even sometimes at much uh, older ages, like we've had women who are in their 70s saying, my whole life, I have felt terrible about my appearance. I haven't paid attention to it. I've just hidden myself away. I discovered your patterns. And for the very first time in my life, I actually like what I look like. And it's making, and like my husband has noticed and my marriage is better. Like to this extent, which honestly, could I have predicted this? No, like I wouldn't have thought it would be this. Occasionally I'll meet people and they'll burst into tears and want to hug me. Like it's a very rich, deep thing. And of course it's very authentic because that's the journey I went through. And now I'm helping other people to go through it too. Over time, we started with sewing patterns, I broadened to online workshops. Now I have two books. The one that's already been out for a little while is called Ahead of the Curve. And it's all about altering sewing patterns to fit your body. Because even if you buy a cashmere pattern, it may not fit you exactly because we all have unique bodies. And I knew that so much of what had been written in existing sewing books were again, like they weren't necessarily like being fat is bad, but they would say things about bodies that like just weren't true for a lot of people. Or they'd say things like, if you don't have an ideal figure and it's like, what ideal figure, what are you talking about? Like mm. everyone's body is totally different dimensions. It's not even a size thing, right? Like you could be a size four, but if your hips are a size eight, you go around being like, oh, I've got such a big bum. It's like, not really, but clothes aren't made in store for that. So through that book, especially, there have been 
so many amazing pieces of feedback that we've had. Like funnily enough, I, I taped some quotes up on my wall just to kind of occasionally look at when I'm having a bad day. But someone wrote an Amazon review saying, I absolutely love how this book makes me feel normal. Now you could like pick that apart for an hour, right? Like why didn't you feel normal? But also it's amazing that sewing clothes has the ability to have such a massive impact on people. Now there is a kind of not downside is the wrong word, but like flip side to that is people are so invested in it that like they deeply, deeply, deeply care that we have to be very careful about, you know, never doing anything that they feel, you know, breaks their trust. So for instance, like, you know, we very consistently have plus size models, even though we go down to a size zero, we always are like plus size first almost and, and center the needs of plus size people because we're the ones who are overlooked despite being 70% of the population. And then most recently, again, trying to think about this group of people, like I have focused mostly until now on people who sew, who are curvy and want these kind of patterns. But then I realized like, you know, the really huge opportunity is bringing people who don't sew in and people who are like dejectedly walking around the mall, failing to find anything, feeling terrible about themselves and be like, Hey, come over here, come into our gang, because we'll tell you how these things can change. Mm -hmm. So that's why when my publisher asked me, for another book, I decided to write Sewing the Curve, which is my book that's out in November. And that's all about teaching yourself to sew. And again, it's body positive, it's empowering, and, and it helps, I think, neutralize people's feelings about their body just by being neutral about the reality. You know, I say, you take your measurements, it's just the same as reading a recipe and how much flour is in a cake. It's not good or bad that your waist is 40 inches. It's just a measurement so that you can make a skirt that fits in the same way that one cup of flour makes a tasty cake. Like it's just information. And I think at Cashmere, we've managed to be fairly successful actually. in like kind of bringing people along this journey to mm. at the very least get to a place of neutrality. Not everyone can get to positive and that's fine, but at least to a place of like leaving behind some of these ideas that have been foisted on you over the years and kind of like empower you to do it yourself. Mm. It's like a journey from judgment of others to letting go of at least of the self-judgment, because I think that's often what happens, isn't it? Because we've been judged by others for some aspect of ourselves, we take that on as a reality and we're harsh on ourselves. And I think getting people to the point where they can be compassionate with themselves and then be able to see their sizes, it's just a measurement, it's not good or bad, is, yeah. is like a huge step for some people. Absolutely. And I think that ultimately deliberately launching a like mission led business has been so great for me on so many levels, you know, like, first of all, it just makes you feel good. Right. So it's nice knowing that you've helped people. The second one is from a PNG perspective, like you're thinking from a like consumer as boss perspective, it's ideal. Like it's like, I have a genuine deep emotional connection. The Charmin team desperately want that. And they're working on it really, really hard, but it's a little bit tricky, right? Like not everyone feels emotional about toilet paper, but people do really, really, really feel emotional about body image and how they present to the world. So, you know, we have this very authentic, strong, emotional connection with my customers, which obviously from a business perspective is great. Like I'm not exploiting them, but I know them deeply and they really care about this topic. And I think ultimately, like if you can do that, it helps. Like I'm not primarily financially driven. I don't think I would have set up a company in the sewing industry if I was, but I think also it can, it can be hard if you run your own business and that's your primary driver. It's a lot easier if, you know, you, yes, you want it to be successful financially, but also you're genuinely feeling good about the impact you're having on the world. Yeah. And I think a lot of people listening to this podcast, because that's the work I do, are looking to have an impact in the world and looking to create an alignment between who they are, the skills and the talents, the strengths that they have to bring to the world, a purpose of having an impact and, and the kind of life they want to live mm -hmm. that's compatible with the life they want to live. And I think you are a really wonderful example of someone who's managed to weave those threads together in their life. What would you say to someone who is at that point, maybe in the corporate world or in a job that they don't love? And who wants to have more impact, who wants to have a, a lifestyle that they get up in the morning and they think, great, I can have a great day today. What would your advice be? I mean, I'm very much like encouraging of that. Like when people tell me that they want to do it, I'm like, 
give it a go. You know, like obviously there's a certain amount of privilege to being able to even do it, but you know, why not? What's, what's the worst that happens? You learn probably more than you have in years in your corporate job, because once it's all on you, you know, you have to know a bit about everything. And so it's such a rich, rich learning experience. I would say that I really think all successful businesses come from some kind of consumer customer insight. So I think you really do want to identify an unmet need and meet it, which is very explicitly what I did. I think that makes a huge difference. And I think having like a a realistic understanding of what's possible. Like I knew when I set it up, I'm not going to be making a million pounds income in my first year. Like there's no way. I knew that it will grow and it will be a little bit slow to begin with, but maybe in the future, there's somewhere I can be. And as I said, like people think of my business as niche, even though I kind of resist that idea. But again, if you're not looking to set up a startup, which I think is very different. If you want a startup with like VC funding and things like that, then sure, you need some like idea with potential billion dollars. But if you just want to have a nice life and employ some people and pay them fairly and, you know, be happy, your niches are great. You know, like you can really know, especially if you're in that niche personally, like you can know the people deeply. There aren't many people competing with you. And I think that's really great. The final thing I'd say is I heard a presentation by this woman called Emily McDowell a few years ago, who set up an extremely popular greetings card company, which later like she closed down and she had a lot of mental health challenges with it. And she gave this analogy that she was in the corporate world. She was an art director in an advertising studio and that she got to the top of the ladder and then she realized it was leaning against the wrong wall. And it resonated with me so much because I was doing pretty well in my corporate career. And, you know, like if I had wanted to continue going up, there's every chance I could have. I don't know. Like you never know. But like that's what I was being told. And I realized just because I can doesn't mean I have to. Just because I'm literally capable of whatever, I don't know, whatever level at P&G of being, I don't actually have to do that. I can do something that suits me more and maybe like seems less impressive to the world or maybe makes a bit less money, but you don't have to do it. You don't have to keep on going up the ladder. And also what's the point of going up the ladder if you don't actually like where it's going? And that was a big one for me. I I looked up at people levels above me and I was like, you know what? I actually don't want to do that. I don't want to wake up at five in the morning to have calls with China and then still be going to work meetings at seven. Like you couldn't really pay me enough money to do that. It's not where I want to go. I want a very different life. And Emily McDowell also advised you to think about your daily life. She's like, what would a nice day look like for you? What time would you wake up? Would you be working at a computer or not? Would you be around people or not? How many days a week would you work? Would you be traveling for work? And she's like, you should build your business based on that. Again, not the most money it could possibly make because what she did, she made the mistake of making her business as big as it could possibly be. And then she was like, I hate this. I'm an art director and I'm spending all my time negotiating with the LA customs house to get tote bags out off a ship. She's like, that's not what I wanted. It doesn't matter how much money you pay me. I want a life filled with art and so on. And so again, I took that to heart and it's something I did. And I I really recommend thinking about that. Don't just shoot for the stars in terms of as big as you can possibly get. Think about what do you actually want your daily life to look like? Yeah, that's so powerful. What do you want your daily life to look like? And when you get to that point of looking up and not wanting what's there, just allow yourself to realize that that's not the only option. There Mm -hmm. are other options and you know get some support to think through it that's what I do with people all the time it isn't always easy for people it isn't always obvious but at the end of the day you know you for example Jenny are having much more impact in the world you're having making much more of a difference than you ever would have done if you made that leap Um, and you're having a lot more fun doing it so (laughs) that's that's wonderful well thank you so much it's been great to talk about it And I hope we can keep in touch. Yes, looking forward to it. Thank you so much for having me on, Ruth. Jenny really has founded a fantastic company with Cashmeret. There's a reason why it's so successful. You can just go to cashmeret.com to see the quality of the work, uh, the patterns, the classes, the blog, and of course, Jenny's books. And you can buy them all on the website. You can share with friends who you think might be interested. 
I do just want to point you back to the interview though, because mainly we talked about Jenny's journey and woven in was so much business acumen as well as this key of understanding yourself and what you want well enough to make career and life choices that work for you. Not what someone else thinks will work for you, but what you know will work for you. And I want to underline the final point that Jenny made. Just because you can go up the ladder doesn't mean you should. If you find yourself looking up and thinking, I'm not sure that's what I want, or as Jenny said, you couldn't pay me enough to do that, frankly. Or if you think that the ladder might be leaning against the wrong wall, give yourself the gift of stepping back and asking yourself, what do I really want? And how and where can I make the biggest contribution I can make and thrive whilst doing it. If you'd like some support to think that through, you'd like to chat about how to go about it, then you're welcome to book a 30-minute free session with me. You can go to my website, which is yourpathtosuccess.ch forward slash book appointment, and you can book 30 minutes with me there. I'm also going to be running my annual end of year reflection sessions online on the 7th and 8th of December and you can find out more about it and how to register at your path to success.ch forward slash events. If you've enjoyed this conversation then don't forget to share the joy and the inspiration with your friends and colleagues and don't forget to subscribe to hear more interviews of people telling the story of their personal path to success.